Hello, everybody, and welcome. I can see we've had a few people join us. I know we have uh, more people registered to attend, so we'll just wait a second for people to come in. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Susan Deutsch. I am the program manager at the Muse Writers Center. Uh, the Muse is a creative writing nonprofit in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and we offer classes, workshops, and seminars for all ages, genres, and skill levels. And you can find us at b-muse.org. And we are hosting this event, the Right Start Mostly Speed Critiques, uh, in partnership with the 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book which is a program of Virginia Humanities. And before we go any further, uh, there are closed captions available. If you'd like to turn them on or off, there is a button down at the bottom of your screen to do so. And let me see um, a little housekeeping before we start. Emergency exits are located in the top right corner of your screen. Should there be an emergency, feel free to leave. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of this event. If you're joining us here live in Zoom, use the Q&A function to ask your questions at any point. You don't have to wait until the Q&A section officially starts. We'll see it and we'll get to it then. If you're watching live on YouTube, you can also leave questions in the comment section there. Uh, and again, there are closed captions available. This program is one in a series of six devoted to Virginia writing and publishing which is presented by writing centers such as the Muse and organizations all across Virginia. Uh, in addition to the Muse, other hosts are 1455 Literary Arts, Virgin James River Writers, Randolph College MFA, Watershed Lit, and Writer House. And the full series of events is available at vabook.org, where you can also explore the full festival schedule and watch past events. There are a lot of really exciting events coming up, so I highly suggest you give that a peek as well after this. And while you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to the Mosley Writers Group. It is all you, Jody. Thanks, Susan. And welcome to the Right Start Mosley Speed Critiques. In 1996, Lucy Russell, Andy Straka, Kate Hamilton, Virginia Thompson, and Deborah Prum formed the Mosley Critique Group, which continues to meet today. For 25 years, it has functioned as a resource and support gathering for the 40 plus writers who have participated. Many are published award-winning authors and many continue to provide critique support to each other even after moving away. The Mosley Critique Group has offered presentations on the craft of writing at the Festival of the Book since 1997. As crowds have grown, so has the hosting venue, ultimately landing the event at one of the Omni's largest meeting rooms when we're not virtual. This, the Speed Critique was launched in 2008, so this marks our 15th year offering in the moment feedback on the first 100 words of submitted fiction manuscripts. We got an especially high volume of entries this year, which we're really excited about, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. At the end of the session, we'll get to as many questions as possible too, if you could please follow Susan's directions for how to enter questions for us. Thanks so much for being a part of our event today. Today's panel includes four Mosley writers. Deborah Prum, give us a wave, Debbie. Her award-winning fiction has appeared in the Virginia Quarterly Review, Across the Margin, Streetlight, The Sweet Bay Review, and other outlets. Her essays air on NPR member stations and have appeared in the Washington Post. She's given writing workshops at Writer House, the University of Virginia, James Madison University, and many other places. Betty Joyce Nash is a published journalist and fiction writer. She teaches at Writer House in Charlottesville. She's seeking representation for her first novel. And Meredith Cole, Meredith began her career as a filmmaker and screenwriter and now teaches writing 
Her short stories and essays have appeared in various anthologies and magazines. She was the winner of the St. Martin's Press Malice Domestic Competition, and her first book, Posed for Murder, was nominated for an Agatha Award. Thanks, Jody. Um, and I'm going to introduce Jody. Uh, Jody Hobbs Hessler's stories, essays, articles, and book reviews can be found in the Los Angeles Review, Arts and Letters, Craft, the Bangalore Review, the Rumpus, the Georgia Review, Charlottesville Wine and Country Life, and elsewhere. She teaches at Writer House. And uh, we're really excited to be here. I'm going to um, I'm going to share my screen in just a second, um, and we're going to start our critiques. Um, we got a tremendous number this year, um, which was fantastic. And I know um, we're really not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we're gonna do our best to get to as many as we can. That looks okay. Great. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show each entry on the screen and I'm gonna read it aloud and then the group is going to do our quick speed critique of it and then we will move on. Um, if you have questions at any time, please put them in the Q&A. We're gonna to get to them right at the end um, once we have a chance to sort of look at them and, and figure out where all the questions are coming from. Great, so let's get started. Okay, oops, really wants to go to entry two, but I don't wanna lose entry one. Entry number one. Just after midnight, Buster Matthews pulled into the quick mart in Monk's corner, cut the engine to his pickup truck and tried to stop trembling. He had only been homeless for three hours and he still hadn't adjusted. Beside him, his dog, Bo, whimpered. Hush, Buster said quietly and calmed the dog with a touch. Someone knocked at his window. To his embarrassment, he yelped. A young woman gave him an uneasy wave. Her clothes suggested hard times, a baseball cap with the brim low, blue jean shorts, sneakers, and a bulky sweatshirt, which would be hot on a night like this. All right, who'd like to go first? I'll go. I, this one I, I felt was chock full of uh, concrete details that brought us right into the scene. Uh, we have the time of day, we have that it's hot outside, we have everyone's name and their good names, Buster Matthews at the Quick Martin Monk's Corner. These are very specific names that have a feel to them. So everything that's offered gives us a little bit more than just the detail that it's conveying. It gives us context and brings us in the scene. So I felt like these hundred words really pulled me in. I like them too. I think um, I think the only question I had until the very last was how, why her clothes suggested hard times. They sounded kind of like standard clothes to me, but um, right at the end, he said it was too hot on a night like this. And I think that's something um, that's really, uh, was a great little detail um, that you, I sort of like, oh, that sounds kind of normal, but that she's wearing more clothes kind of suggests homelessness. It's a good detail. Anyone else? You're gonna jump in, nodding, shake your head. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, Bodie Byrne was a godless man who loved churches, drifting in, oh gosh, sorry about that guys. My phone's, it's very sensitive. Drifting in or seeking out chapels and cathedrals, a convent or abbey would do. He considered them vessels of hope that leaked despair. Like airships, they achieved perfect buoyancy. As soon as a believer rose through the roof, a sinner walked in the door. He convinced himself this wasn't philosophical wish-wash. He could admire a church and churchly objects strictly for history, form, artistic ranking. There were many kinds of pilgrims. Bodhi simply appreciated honest efforts to transmit spirit into design, emotion into something useful. Toffee swirl tapestries of faith, hopes, sturdy tresses, charming stained glass charity. Um, I'd like to comment on this one. Uh, I really love this one. I, I like the name Bodie Byrne. I like the fact that the sentence says, the first sentence says a ton. He was a godless man who loved churches. Um, I loved uh, vessels of hope that leaked despair and charming uh, stained glass charity. Um, I thought this was 
really brilliantly done. The only thing I might change, because everything's so elegantly written, in my opinion, um, is the sentence that starts out, there were many kinds of pilgrims. Um, it, next to all the elegant writing, it's oh, adequate, but not, it's a little bit chunky. So um, anyway, that's, that's it. Betty Joyce, did you have anything? Um, I, the only thing that I would mention, um, and because I agree with Debbie and everything that she said, um, but I would love to have seen him actually do something or just be grounded somehow in space. I don't know where I am. And maybe that's not important at this point, but um, yeah, I would love to see him. You're actually. right. We're not in a specific church. At right. This point. We're, we're, we're just anchored somehow. Um, right. But the, the language is really beautiful, especially at the end. It was delightful to read aloud. <laughs> okay, uh, everyone. All right, I'll try to see if I can stop flashing everyone entry after entry. Several men and women perch around the table, Gloha's board of directors, hands folded, faces somber, no brothers or sisters in sight. Chafe heads for the single empty chair, a masterpiece of white leather and chrome, and takes a seat. The darn thing protests under his weight. He grimaces and attempts to raise it up a notch, but it sinks even lower with a resounding pop. Everyone stares at him, unimpressed. Chase spreads his hand in a supplicating gesture. Please call me Chase. Dead silence. Ite, no comment. Fair enough. These crackers are armed against charm. Um, Deb. I, I love the symbolism in this. Uh, the uh, a masterpiece of white leather and chrome. It just it and then the uh, seat. He the person attempts to raise it up a notch, and with a pop, it sinks lower, and everybody side eyes him. I think that's a great symbolic paragraph. Um, I would take all the the italics out. That's just my preference. And then unless people are actually perched on the edge of a table, I would take the word perch out and change it. Uh, but I, I really I really like this. Um, it was a it was a nice um, you know person out of their element, feeling very much you know nervous, and I thought they did a wonderful job of really putting us right there, and we're we're um, sympathizing with Chase right away. I think I I had a, a hiccup in the beginning, and it might be the name Gloha, um, where we're starting at the very beginning of something, so we don't really know what. Uh, what genre we're in. And Gloha to me sounded like it could be a magical community somewhere. So it took me a little while for the for the grounding of the voice and the actual situation to kind of come clear. So, so that was, I thought there might be room for a phrase that just indicated what Gloha was, kind of just a little bit more grounding, concrete detail, maybe even some more concrete details around the room of what of what Chase is seeing, take advantage of his point of view a little more um, abundantly. I, I felt a little bit the same way. I, I would love to maybe just start with the second paragraph. And, um, but it, there is a lot of tension in that first paragraph. And so, um, I don't know, it's your call. You're the author, but um, I was with you, Jody. I wasn't <clears throat> really sure where I was. <clears throat> There's sometimes a desire to name every single thing there. Um, I love that we didn't hear like the names of every board of director member, like that's not important. Um, so that was a great job, but do we need to know the name of the company yet? Like, it's not like it's Nike, like we don't recognize it. It's a made up company, right? So I think that maybe letting that off, uh, not, not saying who it was right away might be fine too. I guess I had one other question though. The, the author let us know in the email that this was a young adult piece. So I wondered what corporation might be interesting to the young adult audience. It seemed like that that was something I was waiting to see clarified. It's hard in the hundred words to get it all in though. <laughs> right, I mean, I just meant like in, in the entry, like here's the entry for this really a YA audience. How would they- When I heard YA, I that? assumed that Chase was a kid but then he didn't seem like a kid. Right, right. So I was, So that was a great question. That's a great question, Jody. Um, so always being careful of your genre. All right, ready? 
<clears throat> Martin hadn't planned on making a pass at the woman who ended up getting him fired. He was relieved that he faced no formal charges. Still, a tension in his jaw stayed with him from the moment he woke up until he drifted off to sleep. He had invited an 18-year-old for a drink in a spirit of collegiality, touching her back as he led her through the doors of the keg. The incident seemed contained within the chemistry, within the chemistry department. He felt they were making an example of him. The young woman hadn't even declared a major. Um, I was just going to say really fast, I felt like I'm reading a synopsis rather than the beginning of the story. Um, and I really feel like um, the scene where he makes the pass at the woman and also, you know, has has his colleagues sanction him. Those are that's great drama. And we're missing out on those scenes. So I would I would be reluctant to like sum up unless something amazingly more dramatic is going to happen after that. I agree. Um, uh, however, I do like that first sentence. Martin had made, planned on making a pass at the woman. I, that is a catchy first sentence, but I agree. I said exactly the same thing as, as Meredith, um, that you, you don't rob her, yourself of that scene. But I do like that first line and then maybe the scene. You could kind of foreshadow the scene like that. You're right. I, I, I guess I, I was going to chime in a little differently on the first sentence. Th there is a, a catchy hook to it, but I've noticed um, with this happen a number in, in number of different entries. When we start with a negative, sometimes it blinds the reader from what the motivation of the character actually is. So I wondered if there was a way to rephrase that that included what his intentions were rather than just kind of tripping us up with what his intentions weren't. Because it's hard to and for me it's hard to enter in on a on a on the absence of a thing. Well, it says a lot about that character. I think there's a kind of character that would be like, well, I didn't mean to rob the bank. It just happened to be there. And then the, the, the money was right there, you know. Um, so right, I was right, kind right. of assuming <laughs> that we're getting that kind of character. Well, but even in the one that you just uh, riffed off the top of your head, there was a but phrase. So he hadn't meant to do this, but that may be the way to round out that sentence and just give us that little bit more that does give us a glimpse of his motivation. It, it, we understand that his motivation is like you're saying, this character who is not really honest with himself, you know, like that kind of thing. And that we get that, that's, that's good. But just that little more would round it out a bit for me. Anyone else? My father was a Chinese scholar who I only knew through photographs hidden from me. I don't remember meeting him, although he didn't leave our little family for a year or so after I was born. I was told once by my mother that he had returned to China to bring Western style learning to the ancient land and its people, but her tight face told me I should not ask any further questions about him. Sometimes when I looked at my brother, Gil, with his thick jet black hair and almond eyes, I wondered if I was also looking at my father. I'll just uh, weigh in on this one. I really am fascinated by this story the, of the, the father who's a scholar, but the family doesn't know him. And, um, but I wonder if it might be better to start with the last line because it's so mysterious. Sometimes when I looked at my brother Gil with his thick jet black hair, I wondered if I was also looking at my father and, and then go in with the explanation because that way we're, we're right in the in the character point of view and, and his longing from the get-go. Yeah, and I noticed one little detail too. Um, the uh, narrator says he didn't leave our little family for a year or so. I, I would, it, since it's a huge thing for a father to leave the family and not come back, I would just take out, the, you don't need the year or so, be specific, you're making it up anyway. So, um, and I agree with, with Betty Joyce. I think starting with her looking at a picture in a scene is, is that is good. Anyone else? Reverend Oliver Matthews didn't expect that tonight wouldn't be ordinary. His life had been. Without regret, he labored from morning into night, endeavoring to improve community life. Most residents lacked gratitude. At 10 p.m., Reverend Matthews walked onto the porch of his parsonage with his tarnished house key in hand. As he opened the door, there was a slight squeak. He removed his black fedora-styled hat and placed it, oh, placed it in the coat closet. 
He patted down his salt and pepper hair while his fatigued blue eyes gazed down the modest foyer and were saddened to return to an empty home. I love this uh, Oliver Matthews guy. I, um, I love the descriptions of him and how he <clears throat> goes to work every day and, um, and his life is ordinary, but I'm left at the end wondering what is exactly happening. Was the empty home different? Was there something different? Um, yeah. I don't think we've gotten to the change yet. Right. So we're saying this is how he does it every day. Um, I thought there were some wonderful details um, in this. I mean, I think I really could see him and that's, um, and that's really, that's a, that's a great thing in the first hundred words to be able to really see that character. I love that he sort of, he does this without regret, but people lack gratitude. <laughs> I, I thought that was a great little, little touch for him. Yeah, I like the tone of this and I immediately felt empathy, but I also felt that, um, and also, uh, why not just give him a fedora instead of a fedora styled hat? Um, but I also felt that something needed to happen pretty quickly to keep my interest longer. I mean, I felt for him, but I wanted an evidence of some sort of conflict by the next paragraph. I, I think there's a tendency to feel that you need to show everything, um, but you do not need to show every character walking through every door and getting into every elevator. So sometimes it's good to jump ahead and, and maybe you write this down because you want to know how he enters every night. But you, if tonight's going to be different, let's get cut to the, you know, cut to where it's different. So right, right. I think spending just a little time on the routine and then jumping in. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I wanted to point out this was another opening sentence that had a couple of negatives in it. And once it's something that that I notice, it, I notice it more, and so that might make me overly sensitive to it, but didn't expect tonight wouldn't be ordinary. I feel like there's probably a tidier, more direct way of saying didn't he didn't expect anything out of the ordinary or just something a little more to the I heart. I stumbled over it a little bit. It was just and, a little, yeah. Yeah, and there was one moment where we're, as he opened the door, there was a slight squeak. And I know that that now after reading it, that that was just a note that that was a squeaky door. But because we've already been set up for this is the night that's not extraordinary, that, that is extraordinary. <laughs> I thought that we were right upon it. Like, here's the noise. <laughs> so um, so yeah. that was just a, just a tip that that's where the reader's mind went. I was ready already, is I think what I'm saying. Ooh. <laughs> All right, moving on. The morning sky in central Oklahoma was green. Robert Smith had never seen a green sky before. He had heard about rare green skies, though, a sign of severe weather renowned in the Oklahoma state. Robert was driving north on I-35, returning home to Oklahoma City after an overnight at a casino down the interstate. His wife, Sunny, his sister-in-law, Suki, and brother-in-law, John Park accompanied him. John was riding shotgun. The two sisters, fading Korean beauties, were in the back, chuckling while watching a spirited Korean talk show on a shared Samsung Galaxy phone. They ignored the ominous proceedings outside. I really like the elements of this, uh, but I, I think you have to get rid of all of the um, passive constructions and get right into Robert Smith's head. I'm just gonna give you an example of maybe how to start, which will show you what I'm saying. Uh, Robert tried to keep his aching eyes on I-35. Last night's casino venture had left him with an aching head and an exhausted body. Oh, I used aching twice, don't. Uh, every few minutes he glanced upward. The morning sky in central Oklahoma looked yellow green. So, so you see just getting right in his eyes and seeing things. And then when you describe the women in the back, describe features of beauty that are fading rather than just saying they're fading. But I love all the elements. I just want you to get into Robert's eyes and hear things and feel things right from his center. And I think it'll um, make this more engaging and lively. But definitely that um, having that green sky in the first line for anybody who's seen a tornado or the yep. beginnings of one would, um, and I'm not even sure you need a sign of severe weather I mean, a green sky is bad, no matter how you cut it. And so I love that 
first line. So his aching eyes can definitely go like, is it my eyes or the green? Is the sky green? So, but he, I, I guess I was confused because he said he's never seen it before, but it's, it's, it's common there or it's known in Oklahoma and he's returning home to home, Oklahoma City. So I didn't quite get that. I felt that there was a contradiction there. Um, so maybe just to work that out, maybe he doesn't, he hasn't lived there very long or something. Um, but I also call this the roll call beginning, which is to say in the car, we have the following people and we start listing them. Um, I think it's um, more natural to have it be like, you know, like you're talking and then, you know, his sister-in-law Suki tapped on, tapped on the seat and said, are we close to where we can get coffee? You know what I mean? Like you, you introduce people as they become relevant to the story as opposed to trying to tell us everybody there. I, I also just wanted to um, like the, the phrase faded Korean beauty is sort of set funny with me. It felt like it sort of objectified the, the women and the ethnicity. And I don't think that's the intention here. So I thought that it would, I, I rewrote a sentence thinking his wife, Sunny, and her sister, Suki, chuckled in the backseat over a spirited Korean talk show establishes a lot of the same information without doing it in the same kind of manner. So just a, a pointer there that that would be another way to approach it. Good point. Anyone have anything else? I um, like the only like the fading because it gave us an idea that they were older because I didn't know about their ages. So, but there's plenty of other ways to do that. That they went to a casino? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I've never been to a casino, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's an excellent, that's, that's a good point. So, all right. A car coasted toward the drop-off with an unconcerned occupant behind the wheel. Unconcerned because he had, a, he had bullet holes in the back of his head. The first shot had deprived the gentleman of life and the next two were for insurance. Now propped upright in the driver's seat, the deceased was only along for the ride. The car did a nosedive into the creek, the rider's head smashing headfirst into the windshield, rendering the face almost unrecognizable. Landing first to the feast were flies, but an arm hanging out the open door, open driver's window would soon attract other scavengers. Now I know you guys are all gonna look at me because I write mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely um, interested in this um, uh, set setup, but um, I didn't have any point of view or character to to attach to, and so I just I felt like it was just a you know a um, a scene in a movie actually I mean it looked like I was just watching it from a distance so I wasn't <clears throat> there was nothing for me to really grab onto. well it's the uh, omniscient point of view well as far as we we can tell right because we we aren't yeah. we don't seem to be in the killer's head mm -hmm. because they're not saying like oh I'm going to drop this guy off because now I'm going to get away um we're not the dead person's point of view um, but we seem to be this watching this thing, but it goes very quickly from someone apparently driving this car off something, having it land in a creek to having flies in one paragraph. That's incredibly fast. I mean, you know, I, so I, I think that's a little, I think that could be probably pulled out a little bit and more detail could be added. Um, we don't necessarily need to know who this person is, but perhaps we're gonna spend the rest of the book trying to figure out who did it. I'm assuming that we're in the mystery genre and not, you know, um, an illustrated children's book. <laughs> so I looked at this as kind of a lyrical beginning um, in a sense that maybe it's a prologue or just a mm -hmm. few sentences. So I don't mind that it went so fast because I'm assuming we'll get into somebody's head uh, uh, right now we're in God's head, but maybe we'll get into somebody's head in the next paragraph. So I, I actually love the way it just coasted from from one um, event to the other and landed with flies and a scavenger. But I guess we have to see what the next paragraph would be. Yeah, I, I feel like it gave me enough in this paragraph that I'd be curious for the next paragraph. There's definitely the concrete grounding details, a, a definite scene that's right. unfolding. I My question, 
isn't it isn't of this paragraph, but of what comes next. Is it possible to sustain this point of view? And if not, how do you manage the segue elegantly so that the reader shifts with the writing um, into a, a more direct point of view? That's not to say it can't be done, but that would that would be a challenge that I see ahead for that manuscript. Yeah, and I'm assuming it's a prologue as well, because I, I don't. There's very few books now that are written in an omniscient point of view, um, often it's just really a prologue. So. All right, anyone else? No. I know you remember the first time we met. We started by just casually hanging out with your friends on weekends. Our relationship was easy, no serious commitments. Those times felt like so much fun. As our relationship grew, some of your friends said they didn't like the way you acted when we were together. But there were some who understood our relationship as they were in one of their own. We began to spend more and more time together. Then you decided we should take our relationship to the next level. It made perfect sense that we should move in together. I really like the easy conversational tone, intimate. It's very intimate from the first sentence. I know you remember the first time we met. And, um, but I was wondering, where it made me suspicious because I did, couldn't really sense the tension that right. maybe it's coming later. There's an ominousness in the first line. I know you remember when we first met. <laughs> it, could, it could direct us anywhere. But the, the next sentence is, to me, they unfold almost like a synopsis of their relationship. Um, and I'm wondering, what is the now of this story? What, what are we walking in on? Yeah. Yeah, it's also interesting to be addressed. Um, the reader is being addressed as this person in the relationship. It's an interesting choice. Yeah. No, I don't remember hanging out with you. <laughs> <laughs> <In fact. laughs> oh. Anyone else? Okay. Ash carefully placed the Trader Joe bag on a pharmacy shelf in plain view of the public counter. She pulled a Sharpie from her lab coat pocket and wrote dad on it so no one would disturb her father's remains. She needed him here. He was the award-winning pharmacist. Her skill was in the clean room under the sterile guard hood, handling medicines under aseptic techniques. Now she had to handle patients. She stared at the bag, hoping for the guidance he'd always given, then surveyed the counter, confident that patients would feel safer too, knowing he was right there. I, I love the dark humor in this piece uh, and the unexpectedness of it and the fact that she's writing dad on it. I think those are all great points. The only thing I would um, uh, question is um, uh, the writer's assuming that people are gonna know what a sterile guard hood is and the word aseptic is and um, what was there another thing I can't remember. Uh, uh, so I might just take um, a sterile guard out of that and, and describe the sterile guard hood. But, but I just love this. I love uh, the quirkiness of it. I didn't know that pharmacists could win awards. So I don't know, I've, I've learned something new. Um, yeah, I loved, I loved that the remains were put in the Trader Joe bag. I thought that was just so, um, <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, kind of hilarious. I also, I also loved the idea that the patients would feel safer too, knowing yeah. that the was there in a little plastic bag <laughs> off to the side. That, that was such a charming detail. And, and it sets us up for a story that's either about grief or potentially about murder. You could kind of go either direction from here and both directions would be interesting. I, I have to say, I, I thought the, the sterile guard and the aseptic were, were, because they were pharmacist specific, I felt like they were appropriate. I feel like sometimes um, when we're in a setting in a book, it takes us to these pieces of it that we're not as familiar with and then makes us familiar. So to me, I was okay with that. Yeah, I was too. I, um, I, I actually liked those details because you can infer that it's just some kind of special pharmacist thing. And so it really did put us in the scene. But I think also to, to Debbie's point, sometimes it's not good to knock someone over the head with that in the first hundred words. Um, so you could also just say her skill was in the clean, clean, clean room handling medicines um, using you know advanced techniques. And I think 
we would all be fine. We, we would get it. She's not a people person. Her dad, even with his, in his ashes, is more of a people person than she is. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Only a father could look dignified wearing handcuffs. He stood quietly listening to the detective recite his rights and paying no attention to the metal rings on his wrists as if they were merely accessories bought in the same expensive men's store as his suit. It seemed indecent to stare at him. So I stared at the detective instead, wondering if I should ride to the police station with father. The detective answered my questions for me, leaving me standing in the driveway holding a search warrant as other police officers trooped into the house to start pawing through our lives. I, I love this one. I, I really do. I love everything about it. it. It grabbed me right at the first sentence. The only thing I would change is the second sentence. I would make it into two sentences because you want people to keep moving along and that it took me a couple of reads to get through, but I really love this. And I love the humor in it. Me too. Yeah, I thought that was at that first line. Only father could look dignified wearing handcuffs was great. It tells so much about about all the characters. Well, the two characters that were really, you know, the narrator and the father. Um, I am curious, and I don't need the answer right now, but I'm curious about how old the narrator is and kind of what the dynamic is of that father-child relationship at this point. Um, it feels like it's, a, it's an adult, I would assume, rather than a child because they're holding the search warrant. But um, beyond that, I don't know. So, <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. The days grow longer and the temperatures warmer, but summer's still a few weeks away. These final dewy spring mornings when the fledgling bluebirds start to practice flying are some of my favorite of the year. The little guys are really quite terrible at flying, often falling more than succeeding, but I applaud their persistence. In all my years of watching them in the big oak tree out back, I've never seen one give up, and I've watched hundreds of them take that first bold leap from the nest. It's a very naturalist's beginning, um, which makes me wonder if that's the setting, you know, it, it, I would expect that then to kind of form a part of the tone or setting of the book, some sort of a naturalist's eye. Um, there's a lot that's really beautiful in this, though I do wonder, um, like this has come up a few times, is what is the scene that we're in? What's prompting this reverie? Um, so to me, sometimes the reverie feels like it could be better used as sort of that backstory to fill in um, a scene rather than something to bring us in on from the beginning most of the time. Well, something to be um, really conscious of is this is not actually a scene, it's a summary. So this is not Monday morning watching a bluebird right. try to fly, right? which is a very specific be. scene where you're there and you're holding your coffee and you're watching this thing and you're kind of cheering them on. It's a very general statement about bluebirds right. and, and it feels a little too general to me to really invite me in at this point. Right. Anyone? Yeah, I agree. There's um, just the notion of watching the fledgling bluebirds is beautiful and I could picture it and I like that but again there's um it's not a specific scene okay I'm gonna go to the next one the first to arrive is the former sheriff in farm attire complete with stained green deer he is obese and angry after four sullen years in Petersburg federal pen for grand larceny the host knows his favorite libation, red stri striped beer. 10 minutes later, the host's personal lawyer and aide comes, slim and white haired in his newest gray pinstripe, despite the cold and ice. He sniffs at Lugavillan scotch, neat as usual. The third arrives a half hour later, the self-styled organizer, 50s ball cap over an archaic mullet, bizarre scar around mouth and chin, pressed chinos, sky blue sweater rolled to the elbows showing sleeves of animalistic tattoos. I really like the specificity in here and I'm intrigued about this gathering of notables or questionable characters. 
So I'd prefer to leave on the page rather than have a drink with any of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Even though they are a very interesting array of drinks, they are. <laughs> yes. And I think we cut off his drink because we ran out of um, words. <laughs> but... <laughs> and, and the voice, the descriptions, farm attire, complete with stained green deer. <clears throat> I wasn't sure if that was a hat or a... Right, yeah. I'm with you there. Or maybe I, I that's also... all of it. All of it is deer. <laughs> exactly, all stained, all, all themed. I, I, I felt like um, in this one, I, I felt like there was so much really great uh, gritty detail that, that, that brought me into the scene. But one thing kind of held me back, and I think it was that the point of view could have been more embodied. I, and I'm going to give a sample sentence, which I don't recommend in terms of what it says, exactly what it says, but what it does. So Johnny, the town embezzler, arranged a reunion of likeliest suspects Saturday at his farm out in blank. So I, I don't want that sentence, but I want that information. Who is the host? It's sort of mysterious. And I'm, it, I suspect that the host is also the point of view character. <clears throat> if that's the case, I want to be seeing these characters arriving through that lens and kind of get just that little bit more information about why these people are together because they're obviously very different and gathering for a social purpose. Right. I think sometimes that people um, keep it a secret because they feel that creates suspense, but instead it might keep a wall between us and the story or create right. confusion. Right. Because There's maybe the host, it's kind of like it's this mysterious character or whatever, but I, instead we're like, huh, well, we don't really care. But in fact, if we were in that, is the host a 18 year old boy? who wants to revenge his father's death, is the host um, someone who's trying to get back at the town and who's 60 years old, like that would help us get into that story. Absolutely, jump right in. And we're, we're on the edge of it now, on the brim waiting to jump in. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. August 1st, 1979, San Francisco, California. She had milky white skin that burned red when she played near the lake. So her parents changed her name. They called her Pearl, the one with stringy brunette locks. Her folks named her Pearl for she was precious to them and reason enough for them leaving the darkness of Kentucky coal mines. They moved across the state line to Cincinnati that promised opportunity for their Pearl. While they made decent tip money and working bar service jobs and whatnot, they couldn't reel in that rambunctious girl. Pearl grew up, she had dreams. These are a, a lot of good images and ideas. Um, you know, I like the first sentence. I think for me to be more um, pulled into this story, it, it needs to start with a scene or from um, the thoughts or feelings of the narrator, like uh, getting right into the narrator's point of view. For, for me right now, this is a summary um, and I'd like it to be something a tiny bit different that engages me more. I'm also a little bit confused because I'm told I'm in San Francisco, but then we're in Kentucky coal mines and we're moving to Cincinnati and I'm like, so we're still not in California. <laughs> so when, when do we get to California? Also, there seems to be two contradictory reasons for her to be named Pearl right next to each other. One is her milky white skin and the other is because she's precious. And so it kind of, it, I feel like that, that could be both things, but I feel like they've just been contradicted. So. And we get that they changed her name to Pearl. So and then they said she's pre so she wasn't precious when she was born. But then right, so, so th th there was some clarity that could just be solved, like right out of the blocks. And yeah. uh, clarity in the scene would be good too. I feel like the story really wants to begin with when Pearl grew up and she had these dreams, and they were being they were being uh, ruined for one reason or another. So I, I I feel like her backstory may become more relevant once we get her her four story, so to speak, and kind of see what is this broken dream she's struggling with. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jody, because one of the things that I always try to remember when I'm writing an opening of a story, which is very hard to do, is that um, you may have a really good chance of wanting to change it once the story is actually finished and once you've revised it. And so, so don't, you know, it's, it, it's okay if your opening is a little bit, you know, um, all over the map at first. And, and then once 
as Jody pointed out, once you the story itself is clarified, you know, you may come back and at least tweak it. Certainly, who hasn't done that? Often you start too early. Almost no one starts too late. Um, so you start really early, um, and you need to take some stuff away or or take some of this info and, and kind of weave it in a little bit more rather than just trying to present it all. Yeah, I, I find one technique that I use sometimes when I'm writing something and a lot of backstory just keeps falling out all at the same time is I'll just create a whole other file and write the backstory. And then it means as I'm creating the action going forward, I have what I need to pull in when it's necessary. And it gets it out of my, it gets it out of my head at that point when it comes into my head. So I think that that helps me. Um, yeah, it's that. super, it's super important that you know so much about your character. I mean, that if someone said to you, what's their favorite color, you'd be able to tell them, but you don't necessarily have to tell us all of that. You just have to write like you know it. <laughs> right, and right then, from that authority. Exact from that authority. And that if you were questioned, you would know it. But we don't need to have a list of every single characteristic about your character. We need to just know enough for the story. So. OK, anyone else? There was a knocking at the door. What waited on the other side would change her life forever. Death does that. <laughs> Six people stood quietly in a wide circle deep in a forest under a moonless sky, waiting. The silence was broken by the sound of popping twigs and crackling leaves in the distance as if a raging fire was rushing towards them. But something much more destructive came out of the darkness. A thin older man limped into the circle, gloating. Good evening, Council. Thank you for coming on short notice. Anyone? I like this beginning. It was intriguing. Um, I, I just, I might take the there was out, just use, do something other than a passive construction there. Um, um, and in the second paragraph, I loved all the images. Um, uh, there's something about it that made me want to be closer in it. Um, uh, for example, the silence was broken by the sound of popping twigs. Maybe have someone hear the sound of popping twigs, you know, instead of the silence was broken by it. But I really did like this. It drew me in and I wanted to read more. So we're, we're once again, we're in that omniscient voice. So I guess it's like God's point of view or whatever you would say. I mean, because we don't have a, it, we've got six people and we don't know who they are. We don't know if one of them who's telling this story. You know, I was standing among six people in a forest. I mean, we don't have any of that, which can make it very spooky. Um, but I don't think yeah, you could sustain a whole book, you know, very easily that way. Yeah, I also I also feel like we have some really good details, but I, like like Debbie was saying, if we have the point of view to to give us context, then we get we get deeper in. I, I'm we, we are introduced to a flood of nameless people. Um, and there's a sense of ominousness that's more told than revealed. Um, we're told that this skinny man coming out, limping out, is more dangerous than a fire raging, but I can't see it yet. So I think that context, that pulling those con that the, the point of view into service and bringing us more context would give us more oomph. Yeah. Mary, yeah I, I think we have time for maybe one more because it's about 10 of one. So okay. maybe we can do one more. One more. And four questions. <clears throat> Andy Jordan was scared, rigid neck, iron bound stomach, wobbly knees scared. She tripped over a root that had curled its way up from underground in the clearing outside Eden's cabin. Writing herself, she stood still, even had asked the impossible. Oblivious to bird calls in the breeze, she heard only a buzzing from deep inside her head. Its vibration blurred the scenery. Eben had spoken with disgust. Just choose to change your mind, Andy. There's no eternal truth. You have a choice. Go outside and think about it. I have nothing to say until you do. That's when the buzzing began. I, I would start this um, more in the second paragraph. And I would, I think you have tons of really good um, elements here, really fascinating elements, but it's confusing, at least to me as a reader. I would put this in chronological order and, and then that's when the buzzing began. We'll have far more emphasis. I wouldn't talk about buzzing near the beginning. I would just build to it. And I would start with the conversation with Eben. 
It's a good idea. I, I also, I wanted to say these are really good descriptions of fear. These are, they're very body specific. Um, some of them like iron bound stomach is definitely not the same as just the turned stomach. You know, there's a lot of um, what I call cliches of the body that this one seems to um, avoid. Uh, but I would say that what we have is this moment of, of conflict, just choose to change your mind, go outside and think about it. It would be, it would pull me in a lot more if instead we had an interchange at that point and we got to see a little bit more about who Andy was and what this, what this changing, what, what is this crisis that, that, that she's facing. So um, there's a, there's a, Again, that like Meredith mentioned something about, you know, when we think we're making suspense, but sometimes we're actually kind of keeping a wall between the reader and the action. I always prefer interaction to inaction. And we've taken this character out of an interaction and plunged her into inaction. Good point. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, may I mention something? Um, so um, I, if, if your uh, entry wasn't read, j just because um, we're in this virtual uh, world and um, things are different in the real world, I'm going to uh, send comments to, to people over the next couple of days, especially the ones that haven't been read, just so you don't feel um, sad about uh, not, not having your entry read. You'll, you'll get some comments. Awesome. Um, while, while Meredith browses some of the questions to get started, I was going to mention some of the things that I noticed looking at all of them to try. I was aware that we wouldn't be able to get to all of them. So I was trying to think of some things that recurred that might be helpful in general for people to hear about. And one of the things that came up in a number of these was the importance of starting in scene where the scene and the situation, the crisis are, are, are clear. Um, and also the characterization. Uh, one of the things I went through each of these entries and thought about is, is characterization present here? And sometimes when there's just backstory or whatever, we don't get that characterization quite as much. And the other, the other thing that I was really looking for were grounding details, something concrete in the now that has to do with scene and situation. They, all the, those elements work together. But those are some things I was looking for just as a heads up. So um, we have just a couple questions. One person said, um, why do we do 100 words rather than two pages? Um, and um, I think, first of all, two pages is a lot for us to read. <laughs> but the question is, um, a lot of people don't give a book two pages. So I think one of the things that we talk about is that you have to grab people in the first couple of paragraphs. So. Um, when you pick up a book, like how long does it take before you say, I want to buy this book or I want to read this book? I, I agree. And that from that's from, on the one hand, like the marketing standpoint as writers producing a product, but as writers also having appreciated reading, um, anytime, I, I, I do a lot of, you know, in my teaching, I talk a lot about opening lines and we'll look at, we I mean, have, have students bring in their favorite books, for example, and share just the first two sentences. And from the first two sentences, you can use, usually gather tone, genre, um, a little inkling of, of, um, of characterization and what's happening around you. And so, so it's helpful to look at the first lines of things you really admire to, to kind of get an idea of what's accomplished. It's really interesting when you've finished reading a book you really like to go back and read that first paragraph and see how much was predicted and foreshadowed from just the opening lines. So, so agreed, it, is, it would be six, it would have been about 70 pages or something of, of reading for us to do and critique on. And we definitely wouldn't have gotten through more than two or three in the time period of, for this format. But also those opening lines really do uh, bring a lot to the table. Um, here's another question. Um, what would be your top two or three elements that must be in the first hundred words? And the person suggested main character um, setting, mood, time, frame, et cetera. Um, I find that the, I, the more, the longer I write, the more I understand that the best thing to do to be is in a strong point of view 
right off the bat. And that will inform everything else. It'll inform your setting, it'll inform action. Just get in the head of that person and that will launch your story. And I wanna just take a second to also uh, answer another question about uh, why sometimes there are only one or two of us that will respond. It has nothing to do with the quality of your piece at all. Uh, we're just trying to move through as many um, uh, entries as possible. And if one or two people say what you were gonna say, then we stay silent. But anyway, point of view is- Great the point, answer. great point. I was gonna answer that, I'm typing it, but I, that was better than I could have said <laughs> while typing, while chewing gum at the same time. <laughs> um, someone said, what's our opinion of prologues? Some have said not to have one. Um, I think there's as many opinions of prologues as there are people who read books. I mean, quite frankly, like some people don't mind them or like them. Some maybe agents say they're old fashioned. Um, I think they can be a crutch and it might be worthwhile while you're editing to just say to yourself, do I need this or not? And if the answer is yes, then do your prologue proudly. I mean, that's my feeling. Great answer. I, I'd add one thing, which is basically when I come to a book as a reader, um, when I'm, it's not something I'm critiquing, I just accept it the way it is. If there's a prologue, I enjoy a prologue. So that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Um, are there any openings in older classic novels that are missing from, and you would like to see more in contemporary works? Do you feel like they used to open books better? I feel like <laughs> they used to get away with murder. Now I feel like you have to be, when I read some older classics that are wonderful, I think, oh my gosh, these have gone on for you know three or four pages and not anything is happening yet they did very well as a classic. So um, <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> I think it's really important if you're only reading classic novels when you're writing and you're hoping to get published today that you make sure to also read contemporary novels. There's things that were very common like um, omniscient, using an omniscient voice that are much less common now. They really want you to choose a point of view, whether that's third person or first person or whatever. And so that it's really important to sort of, to acquaint yourself with how people are writing today. It's kind of like when I teach mystery writing and people are like, I love Agatha Christie and that's all I read. I'm like, you should probably read some newer mystery authors because there's amazing mystery authors and they write very differently and that's who's getting published today. Unfortunately, that is our time for today, but thank you so much to all of our panelists. I know I personally learned a lot from hearing all of y'all's feedback. Thank you to everyone who joined us live. And if you're watching after, thank you for watching. Be sure to check out the Mosley Writers on Facebook and you can find the muse at the-muse.org and look at the full schedule of the 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. And thank you so much to our captioner. We really appreciate all your work. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us.